Today we meet the man who thinks he can cure climate change with pure commercialism. This is the Architects of Business, Joe's series of interviews with leading entrepreneurs who see opportunities in solving the world's problems. I'm Ty Genrice and today I'll talk to Norman Crowley, who's taken a very blunt approach to reducing energy use. That saving money is more motivating than saving the planet. Norman, I'm glad you're in a good mood. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming in to see us. Um, <laughs> it does seem like the kind of premise of your latest enterprise is that, you know, we're going to save the planet not by appealing to people, people's consciousness, but their, their wallets. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's part of it. Uh, but also, look, people have complicated lives, right, with other problems. So I think if you appeal to their conscience, their conscience has got a lot on, you know. So I think appealing to their wallet is definitely working. Because the wallet is the, the clearest and most present danger? Well... In our current business in energy, people waste, well, we work with corporations and they waste about half the energy they consume. So for us, it's a pretty straightforward job, you know, walk in and go, you look, stop doing that, you know, change that, install one of these. And over time now, it's gotten to be quite big projects, you know. Mm. Why does it take a kind of an external set of eyes, you think, to, to, hide, to spot those obvious wastages? Yeah, it's... Um, like the technical reason is because years ago you used to have apprentices, right? So there's a town in the UK, Doncaster, used to have 6,000 apprentices every year, right? And they were taught how to fix things and the fundamentals of steam and the fundamentals of chilling. And now companies don't, everyone now wants an arts degree or a degree in philosophy. So nobody understands how a steam boiler works anymore. So we've, what we did first was we hired the normally older men <laughs> who understood how fundamentally this stuff worked. And then what we did was we put that into an amazing piece of software that now watches factories and knows when they're not working. So you're saying that, you know, young kids these days are too busy chasing dreams of being pop stars and artists as opposed to There's being a lot engineers. Of that. Yeah, nobody. And the other thing is, if you even think about a mechanic, right? Years ago, a mechanic knew how to take apart a starter in a car. Now, when you drive in with your car, they plug it in and go, oh, yeah, it's B4 needs to be replaced with a new chip. Right. So they don't know what that chip is. They don't know anything about it. Yeah. Give us some examples of kind of crazy uh, examples of, of um, energy waste that you've you've uncovered down through the years. Yeah. So we're we're doing a project in uh, the Middle East at the moment for one of the biggest shopping malls in the world. And its energy bill is about forty six million dollars a year. And um our guys spent four days reprogramming the control software and saved them $13 million a year. 13 million? Uh, yeah. And the engineers on site kind of fought them all the way, disagreeing. Like, it's fascinating, the misunderstanding of the fundamentals. Like, you turn around and you say, well, this is the way it should be. And they go, well, that's not the way we learned it. And we're going, well, who taught you? And they go, well, this friend of mine. And so this crazy waste caused by this lack of understanding. Yeah. How, um, what was it? What was the missing link with that particular that one, project? It was, without getting nerdy, it was sequencing, basically. So the wrong machines were coming in at the wrong time. So instead of needing two machines to cool a shopping mall, the software was calling in 15 machines. Yeah. Right. And then they were all fighting with each other. Yeah. I think we've already gone down the nerdy route now. <laughs> and that was a pretty high-level version there. <laughs> and listen, is it all kind of motivated by money? I mean, have you ever gone into a company and and, and help them or told them, actually, if you do this, uh, it'll be better for the planet. It might cost a little bit more, but... Yeah. Um, Sadly, it's 98% money. You know, there's 2%. The icing on the cake is is um, the rest, you know. But, you know, when we when we were looking at our foundation, um, which I'm sure we'll talk about, like, we, we're the same thing with humans, right? So we think of industries are different, right? But, like, I can motivate an, a client in the industry with just money, basically. You just say, I'm going to save you $100 million. And they say, are you sure? Yes, done. But with humans, I think humans, it might be even 70, 30, that, you know, if it was 70% money, it might be 30%. Humans individually care more. But even with humans, you have to make it extremely attractive for them to do something about climate change. Yeah. And people will be surprised by, you know, the entirety of what you're doing, because there is this perception out there that saving the planet is not going to come cheap. Yeah. And actually saving the planet is going to save trillions, like literally trillions. Like 
if you think about the thing that's coming in now that everyone is probably to a degree still dismissing, which is electric cars, like electric cars are more than one tenth the running cost of an ordinary car. Like you don't have to service a Tesla only every two and a half years, you know, like so. And then if you look at simple things now that we have in our houses, like you don't have to replace a light bulb anymore, you know, so. And the same things that happen with us as consumers are happening in industry. It's the same stuff like a car, for instance, if you go back to the fundamentals of a car, it's a phenomenally in, inefficient way of moving somebody. To give you an idea of the, of the fact, um, 2% of the energy that your car uses is, use, is moving you, right? The other 98% is wasted. Yeah. It's either it's moving, moving it's moving plastic or like an internal combustion engine for a start is only 28% efficient, right? So the rest of it's gone out in smoke and heat. So it's back to the fundamentals of everything. And, and the stuff we do around climate change is like, what's the fundamental? So I'll give you an ex another example. People don't like in order to solve climate change, we need to stop eating meat. OK, so I eat meat. Right. So why do people eat meat? Let's instead of fixing it the way green people have been fixing it for years, which is you are very bold and you must eat a veggie burger that looks like a hockey puck and nobody in their right mind would eat it. Right. So why do we all hate veggie burgers? Right. Now, people over time just go, uh, I don't know. But actually, the science back to the fundamentals like meat contains heme, hemoglobin, right? We are programmed for, you know, thousands of years to want to eat meat because of heme, right? So how do you solve this problem? Answer, you put heme into something that looks like meat, but is really vegetable. And guess what, right? You look skeptical, quite rightly. Well, I mean, it's still, I mean, it's still not going to make me want to turn down a juicy steak. No, and you see the extreme. One of the examples on climate change is what well, you just did, right, which is go to the extreme. It's like, I, I, I eat a juicy steak, but maybe not. How about this for an idea? Why don't we just do it once a week or once a month? And the other, why don't we three days a week eat Beyond Meat burgers, which look like burgers, taste like burgers, smell like burgers. And it's the same with, when we talk to people about electric cars, they go, well, sure, I can't drive to Donegal in that, right? And we're, we're not saying, but here's a mad idea. Most families have two cars. Why don't you take the petrol one and drive to Donegal? But when you need to go into town, which is what you're doing 99% of the time, why don't you take the faster, nicer, quieter one? Yeah. But you were mentioning Tesla there earlier. Mm. And I mean, electric cars have been with us for quite some time, but previously they looked like something out of a, a like bad that. version of yeah. the Jetsons. Absolutely. Now you've got Teslas, which are sexy yeah. as hell. Yeah. They're still probably bigger than we need them to be. I mean, if you want yeah. to be truly efficient, you just need a little, you know, around or whatever. a little yeah. a little pod for, yeah. for just you on yeah. your commute. But we do like our size, you know. Size <laughs> so matters. Size does matter. Sadly. And maybe it's yeah. time to park that conversation. <laughs> um, but do you think, has it been kind of like a failing of the Green Lobby to, 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 to think that they can appeal to our consciences? The, the biggest failing, and, and I did a piece on radio a couple of months ago on the Green Party. I don't criticize the Green Party. I think Eamon Ryan has done a very good job. I think the way we see the world is you have Trump on one side, crazy, nonsensical extreme, and then you have the Greens on the other side, equally as crazy on the other side, because they don't have solutions. If you, We always give the example, if you take a husband and wife couple in leak slip, who he, she works in Intel and he works for a pharmaceutical company, you know, they earn 110,000 a year between them. You have to ask them to do something whatever you ask, they have to be willing to do. And we always put our ourselves in their position. So what did the Green Lobby say? Take less foreign holidays. Well, guess what? The only bit of joy they have every year is when they go to Spain or whatever it is, right? So what? And then you're saying you must do without. Everything on the green side is you must do without, right? And the message we're changing is, hey, it's not. we don't want you to do without anything. This stuff that's coming down the tracks is just way cooler than anything you've seen before. OK, I'm sure Eamon Ryan will have something to say about all that. But sure, listen, <laughs> let's go back in time, shall we? Because you're one of those people who has sat in that chair and, it, you know, you're, you're clearly passionate about what you do. But some people are so passionate about their their company. Mm -hmm. That is all they do. Mm -hmm. You've had several passion projects and highly successful companies down through the yeah. years. Yeah. Almost too many to mention. But what are the standouts for you? Um Look, I mean, they all stand out. They're like my wife always says that the companies are like our children, you know, and so they all have different kind of features. So I set up the first one when I was 15 
And its kind of feature was just that massive learning um, that comes with your first company and the massive freedom that comes with it as well, you know. And uh, so each one along the way, the second company, Trinity Commerce, allowed us to retire at 28. So that was probably the standout feature was we were we were young and we were able to kind of have this freedom. You've already been working for 13 years, since well, 15. <laughs> well, weirdly, yeah. And I always said to people at the time, I'd love to retire when I'm 30. But the thing I never realized was that it wasn't about retiring. The fun was actually in the work, you know, and my my dad sadly passed away last year and he was working up until six weeks before he passed. And that's what he wanted to do, you know. Yeah. But, so what were you doing at age 15? So my dad taught me how to weld um, because we lived on a farm and the only way to keep everything going on a farm is to is to fix it yourself, basically. Uh-huh. And, uh, you know, that training of like nobody else can fix this or we don't have the money to fix this forces you to be very resourceful and so we started welding and i started welding for local farmers and stuff like that and that business became a little bit bigger um and then it morphed i was always obsessed i guess with technology and software and it kind of morphed into a software and technology company it's quite a leap from welding to software yeah but if you think about the career if you can call what i've done a career it's like welding software internet software, gambling, gam- gambling on a world stage, and then energy, climate change, again, massive scale at this point, you know. So, and I think there's a curse of the entrepreneur is people like to learn different things. You know, it's not like you, you very rarely see an entrepreneur with one business. If they're established, they have a couple of businesses in a couple of different areas. And it's probably to alleviate the boredom and also, one of the keys I think to happiness is learning. If you're not learning, you're, you just get a bit frustrated. And so the challenge if you set up a new business is you have to learn. Yeah. Mm. What kind of vision does it take to be a successful entrepreneur? I think I try and avoid a lot of the big words. Uh, well, I know vision's not a big word, but I try and avoid words that are buzzwords because they're all overused, you know. Um, I think, you know, vision, you know, if you just sat there in the morning and you tried to have vision, you just couldn't, you know. Vision comes, like a lot of the entrepreneurial achievements, they come from desperation. Like people say, how do you do a startup? Well, guess what? You just leave your job in the morning and you do it, right? And it's scary as hell. And yeah, you like people say to me, well, I have a family, I can't do that, right? Well, guess what? It's going to be really scary when you do it. But when you're really scared, and you're working, you have to work very hard, you become that person and that person then has vision. But don't you have to have the right idea as well? I think the idea is probably the weakest bit of it. Yeah, I jokingly say, and it's kind of partially true, that I have 60 ideas by the time I get out of the shower in the morning, you know. Uh, well, you're blessed, obviously. But I mean, uh, yeah, look, it's look, more the implementation is is where the win is. Really. But, look, but yeah. looking at your, your, your kind of CV, I mean, it strikes me you've often spotted the the problems that maybe people didn't really realize they yeah. have like all yeah. the best business ideas yeah. when you say it to someone they yeah. kind of think oh yeah of course and yeah. and they didn't and they wish yeah. they thought of it themselves yeah and look there's a i guess if you can see the problems then you that's the first thing like what is it that people are giving out about mainly right now and i see and people say oh there are less inventions now because we have apps that do everything but that's not true like an example is air travel. Like we still, if we're traveling Ryanair, God bless them, we have to arrive. Like we just came back from cycling halfway across Europe, myself and my wife. You had to go to the airport three hours beforehand, right? And you had to make sure you had no shampoo in your bag. Um, so there's an opportunity. There are countless opportunities. All the, like it took me 15 minutes to park earlier. Why? Like there's 15 minutes lost. You know, it's it, there are countless things. Yeah. Mm. One kind of problem that you solved though was a problem for the for, you mentioned gambling there yeah. earlier yeah. um you created was it like the digital one arm bandit well there were uh, yeah so we created what's called server based gaming which is if you think of the craziness of the slot machine like what was happening in 2001 was if you were william hill you had 7000 slot machines and a slot machine would cost you a couple of thousand quid and then every 3 months somebody would get bored with playing it with the slot machine so then you've bought this thing for a couple of thousand quid and then the only way to get any value is to move it to another site or something like that. So what we did was we said, why don't you have one digital machine and then we'll just keep changing the game. And if the X Factor is on telly, we'll have an X Factor game and then we'll keep changing it around. And it took a couple of years, 
but it became kind of crazily efficient. The the digital one arm bandit, for want of a better description, took like seven times more money than a normal machine. Yeah, and it's become a bit of a source of controversy in in, in the UK because yeah. ba- they're not they're not allowed here. But they're the not allowed here legally. There are some knocking around illegally, and that's because the Irish government are afraid to legislate properly gambling, which is a big mistake. In the UK, they've become a source of. It's a great trick in the UK. They've become a great source of politicians talking about them and journalists talking about them. Um, the thing about a betting machine in a in a um, in a betting shop is it's highly regulated. Um, it's you're forced to do a whole load of stuff to make sure somebody can't lose their shirt. And if somebody tries hard enough, they can lose a lot of money. But there are many safeguards. The the thing they're all ignoring in the UK is online gaming, right? You can lose your house in five minutes online and everyone is going, there's this machine in the betting shop where you can lose a thousand quid, right? Well, guess what? There's a machine in your hand where you can lose your house, you know? Um, So there's a slightly, now I don't defend it. There is a percentage of the population who have a problem with gambling. And we spent a lot of time, we set up a foundation trying to understand that. I don't know whether we made any progress or not, you know? Mm. And perhaps m- more regulation is is obviously the, the, the I answer. I don't know whether it's... Look, if somebody wakes up in the morning and wants to lose a lot of money, sadly, I think they'll find a way. Yeah. Okay. The question, what you need to tackle is why Why do you have that feeling? Yeah. Where did that kind of um, eureka moment come from? Because it strikes me you've done a lot of taking, uh, you know, existing technology and making it, making it yeah. digital. It's back to that thing we were talking about seeing an opportunity. It's like if you understand what digital can do, and then you see what the problem is. Like when we said that to William Hill at the time, they said loads of people have tried that and it won't work. And we were like, that makes no sense whatsoever. What it has to work. And it, it's same thing. And if you back to Elon Musk, right? He's there going, you know, traffic is crap. Why don't we build a tunnel under LA, right? And I could think of a hundred reasons why that's a rubbish idea. Apart from they've just won a contract to put, you know, a, a one between Chicago and the airport, right? So it's the same thing. It's like, what is the problem? And then, like, there, I guess that's the first thing. And then, do you have the courage to fix it? It comes back to vision, doesn't it? Because you know, yeah. if 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 you know the the customers you're trying to serve are telling you, don't worry about it. People yeah. have tried this before. It doesn't yeah. work. Yeah. Uh, and yet you pursued yeah. it. And yeah. I think you it's did something similar with, with, with a jukebox. Yeah. You? Yeah. You know what? I think the better possibly word in vision is courage, you know, and courage sadly comes from getting a mixture of wins and losses in life. But if you have if you see that opening and then you say to your mates in the pub, listen, this is what I think the opportunity is. And they go, that's a stupid idea. You have to have the courage to communicate that and keep communicating that. You know, people talk all the time about goals. It's important to have goals, right? That's that's not the right communication of that. The right communication of that is it is important to to have goals or to know what you'd like to achieve, but be clear that you are be willing to communicate that, right? Because when you communicate it, people laugh at you, right? Gandhi said, first they mock you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win, right? And that's so true, right? When you say your idea, people laugh, people mock you and go, that's stupid. And sure, you're only a pharmacist or you're only a fella filling the road. What do you know? That's what everybody says, you know. Are we kind of tying ourselves up in, in focus groups and market research these days that um, yeah. is not really cleverer than uh, a good entrepreneur's gut instinct? Yeah, look, I think it's gut instinct. It's like what we've looked at in the past in, in market research, we've tried it. I'm not a great fan of it. I think you have to, is there an opportunity out there? Do you have the right product for that opportunity? And an example there, you mentioned it was when we had the gaming business, we had jukeboxes and we came up with the idea of if we had a jukebox in a bar that at every song that was ever recorded, wouldn't that be way better than one with 40 CDs that have to be swapped in and out? We did market research on that and the market research for consumers said 2% of people would use it. The market research on the landlord was that only 4% would put it in. Guess what? First one to win out took eight times more money than a normal jukebox. It was sold out for as long as we had the business. We couldn't keep machines in, in the venues. So, you know, same with countless examples, you know, batteries won't work. Electric cars won't work. It's, you know, uh, yeah. So your gut was right on that one. Um, has it ever been wrong? Um, not lately, but it's definitely been wrong. We've never had a spectacular 
failure. I guess the reason for that is that we are very good at listening to people. So if you're going to say, well, I'm going to give somebody this product and they're going to definitely buy it and it's all going to be fine. That's rubbish. You have to come out with the product. It's going to be crap. Try it again, try it again, change it, flick it, all that. If you looked at what Crowley Carbon is now and you looked at Crowley Carbon in 2010, they look like entirely different businesses. Yeah. And people use the word pivot now. But look, people have been pivoting for thousands of years, you know. Mm. And what about instincts when it comes to actually selling up the shop entirely? Because yeah. you've obviously divested yourself of uh, several businesses down yeah. through the years. Yeah. When does that, is it, is it generally brought about by your own instinct or by an approach? Normally you just get sick of it, you know. Um, certainly in the gambling one, we, you know, it had become very big. It, you know, the mistake we made there was that we, we lost, you know, we, it was public in the end, so we didn't really have control of it anymore. We, you know, th- we won't make that mistake again. So rule number one, we have control and we have absolute control. And so you, nobody else gets, like we listen to people's input and we listen to the board, but we run the business. Yeah. Why does that um, bother you particularly, this kind of sense that investors could be more in the driving seat? Because an investor is not an entrepreneur. They are... Their job is to put money in and hopefully make it work. But their advice is very limited in value in our experience because not because they're bad or good. Investors are very smart people. It's because they have never lived it. So they don't have the feel for it, basically. Are they more intrinsically uh, driven, I suppose, by kind of short term gains as opposed yeah, to the other? Well, if you're public, it's a nightmare. Like they only they get they get what's called mark to market every Friday. Right. So they only care about your business up until next Friday. I mean, when you realize that, you just, I wouldn't have any time for them, you know, especially our view now is a five-year view, a 10-year view, a mission-led view, and that's so critical to business. You sound like someone who's been burnt by investors. Yeah, well, I think when we were public and before we were public, we spent a lot of time with investment bankers and they're, look, there's some amazing investment bankers out there, but in general, they're... Uh, not a force of good, I feel. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think you've been let down, haven't you, at some <laughs> point? Yeah, well, we the famous one that happened to us was that we, when our last business was public, we were offered a billion dollars for it. And it's very impolite when somebody offers you a billion dollars not to say yes. I think so. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't think I'll ever be in that position, but uh, you can <laughs> tell me more about right. it. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so round about, what, 2007? Um, the business was public, had a market cap of about maybe half a billion dollars. And we got approached by an Icelandic hedge fund to take it out. They wanted to buy it and they were quite big. They owned 30 percent of American Airlines. They owned House of Fraser. And so they offered us a billion dollars for the business. And we that deal took about maybe six months to put together. And meanwhile, while that was happening, the world was kind of imploding. Lehman Brothers was happening. You know, there was definitely blood in the water. And so what we did was we, like any good person, we pushed it hard to get it closed. Um, And about two hours before it was due to close, um, basically the whole world collapsed. And uh, we were waiting in our office, car idling outside the door, waiting to take us to the lawyer's office um, and sign a deal for a billion dollars. And um, we got a phone call saying it's over. Did you uh, sense it was coming? We were certainly nervous because a couple about a month beforehand, um, we'd got a bit of a shake on the deal, but we managed to put it back together again with different partners. But it was every day you were you thought you were putting your finger in the dike, you know. And uh, so um, so eventually we sold it about seven or eight months later for a half a billion dollars. And the funny thing about the Irish psyche, we set up the business with eight people, never thought it would get to one hundred million dollars, never mind half a billion dollars. And uh, a journalist asked me just after I moved back to Ireland, a journalist said to me, you know, that was unfortunate. Where did it all go wrong? You know? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, only an Irish journalist could ask a question like that. Cynical bunch. <laughs> but how did it feel when you saw those kind of billion dollars snatched away from beneath it was your horrible. nose? It was horrible. You literally feel sick. You know, there's been probably three or four times in my business life where you feel like you've been punched about 50 times and that was one of them you know and it takes a while to get everything back together after that you know the what happened that time was it was a perfect storm and like and you know a lot of people look at the success of business people have and they think that's all just happy clappy 
but like you remember the bad ones more than you remember the good ones like on that particular one what happened was 22nd of December um, the deal collapsed um, 1st of January share price halved then uh, the smoking ban came in in the UK which means you couldn't smoke in betting shops and pubs anymore so gambling the revenue dropped by 50 percent yeah and if you think about our life at the time was get up on a Monday morning in Dublin fly to um, London and um, every fourth week fly to Hong Kong hop on a private jet visit eight casinos every 12th week fly on to Sydney spend three three or four days in Sydney fly home and that was now some people would look at that and and say that was glamorous like it was horrible like I was 18 and a half stone um, like it was just work 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 and um, and then so then you have smoking ban share price in the toilet horrible kind of lifestyle and we grounded out in 2008 we won the Italian national lottery bid for gaming machines we won same thing in Brazil um, and by June um, we were back on top share price was back up everyone was was kind of hailing us to heroes and then around about August I woke up and I couldn't feel my hand and uh, and then by lunchtime I couldn't feel up the whole side and went to the doctors they thought it was very serious they thought it was either motor neuron disease or something and um, it turned out to be just wild stress basically from this lifestyle you know so I woke up one morning went to my business partner and said well, I'm out of here we're done yeah and, and that was it that was it so within what happened three, then? within three weeks we had it sold half a billion dollars and it's still going I'm still flying it actually my business partner at the time he just sold out of it recently actually so uh, so yeah so you know you look at it all with the kind of private jets and the this and the that and you say wow what an amazing lifestyle but actually the thing to be careful about is look it is amazing i wouldn't swap it for anything but be careful what you wish for yeah yeah it's not and you point to any big business person dennis o'brien you name it like i know a lot of these people like look it's a lifestyle of a sort but um you know it never stops at the same time yeah Norman, uh, it feels like Crowley Carmen's really on the march. Is that right? It, yeah, it is definitely. Yeah, I, I don't think we've ever had one that's uh, growing at this speed. Yeah. So, Just put it into context for us. Um, so since January, we've hired uh, globally. We've hired fifty-five people. Um, we're currently hiring thirty people a month. And uh, now, we've opened offices in Barcelona, Raleigh. Sao Paulo, did a joint venture in Sydney, double the size of our office in Dubai, double the size of our office in Dublin. We're just about to open in Toronto. So it's kind of, um, it's all happening. Sorry, Sao Paulo as well. What's so. been the, the, the kind of the catalyst for things growing now so quickly? Yeah. I think we finally got it right to the point where it's very hard for clients to say no. You know, if you walk into a corporation and you say, hey, you're trading at let's keep it simple you're trading at 10 times earnings we can save you 200 million dollars on your energy that's 2 billion on your market cap um how much does that cost is our next question you say let's call it 400 million they go so hang on i'm going to add 2 billion to my market cap for 100 for 400 million in money this is a no-brainer and so people now are saying more and more this is a no-brainer but it's, it's one thing you know turning up with those figures and, yeah. and saying i can do this it's another yeah. thing being able to prove that you have yeah. done it well you see we have bulletproof references now with some of the world's biggest corporations so kind of johnson and johnson google you name it and so and we're very pushy in our old age. And so we can say to somebody, if somebody says no, we can say, well, then you're being irresponsible. Right? And they say, because we do things like we insure the savings. So if somebody says, I don't believe you can get me $200 million, well, we bond it with the biggest insurance company in the world. So we, when we say to you 200 million, you're getting 200 million or an insurance company is gonna pay you. So you're getting it either way, right? So then if you're the CEO of a big company, why is the answer no? That's not an acceptable answer. It's acceptable to say, I'm not using Crawley Carbon, I'm gonna use a competitor. It's not acceptable to do nothing. So yeah. they can't lose? They literally can't lose, yeah. How, how important uh, a part of the product is that insurance policy? You know, it's a good story. We've never had to claim off it because this is, back, look, this is fundamental engineering, right? So it'll always, we the savings are there, but it's a comfort factor for people. Yeah. And what have you ever kind of 
uh, raise a red flag when a company said, actually, we're not interested? If, I mean, would you, would you talk to investors? No, there's no need for us. Like, there's too many people saying yes. Like, we literally can't take on another client this year. Definitely not, you know. So there are too many um, people who need the service, basically. Are there any markets that are kind of grasping the nettle more than others? Uh, globally, no. It's corpor- certain types of corporations. Food companies are very close to it because retailers are pushing them to, to do the right thing. Uh, and also energy is a big part of the cost of delivering food. So food's a big sector, but all sectors, steel, automotive, kind of big buildings, you know. So some of the biggest buildings in the world, we manage the energy for. One of the amazing things about the software is like there are some of the biggest buildings you could possibly imagine in the Middle East. So can't say who the clients are, but imagine the biggest buildings in the Middle East. Um, We manage them remotely from Wicklow. So from Inniscary. So a chiller will turn on in a very large building in Dubai because our software said it was a good idea. You better hope your broadband doesn't fail. <laughs> well, there are, yeah, thankfully there are safeguards because <laughs> it does fail. <laughs> <laughs> from time to time. Yeah. Um, talk to me a bit about what we're doing here because this, it's been in, in the news a fair bit recently yeah. that Ireland is really not living up to its commitments yeah. on uh, reducing carbon emissions. Yeah. yeah. Look, Ireland, uh, frankly, I blame government, you know, um, this government, we've talked to them a lot. We'll continue to talk to them. I think they've been late to the party. I think, to be fair to Leo Varadkar now, I think he's starting to make a move. But boy, is it late, you know, and maybe it's because we've had political turmoil in Ireland and all that. But we're we're very late to the party and the a lot of our politicians don't understand an awful lot of them don't understand this problem they think fixing this problem is about wind turbines in their constituencies and it's got nothing to do with wind turbines they don't understand the opportunity they don't understand the opportunity for ireland um, and what we could do in this country and what we could make this country well, from government perspective uh, what is it about if it's not about wind turbines and in, in it, people's like, backyards look what it's about is something that we're getting very good at in ireland it's about technology right it's about what things can ireland do that make us unique in this climate change thing and like Crowley Carbon is one example there's 50 examples out there but Crowley Carbon as an example is we control the energy of some of the world's biggest corporations from Ireland right so Ireland can't be good at making solar panels and wind turbines because we're, we don't have that history of heavy industry uh, in those things especially but what are we good at we're good at software we know how to sell and the, like that's like we're missing this kind of sadly we're missing this monster opportunity an example is the government themselves government's energy bill is 600 million a year right the government could save half of that right plus make all their buildings and hospitals more comfortable right they were supposed to come up with a plan in 2005 they still haven't implemented it you know so then if you look at if ireland brought solar out they wouldn't have to, they keep saying at the moment they have to subsidize solar in Ireland, right? So they don't have to subsidize it. They just have to enable it and let it happen, right? But they won't because there's a certain ignorance around we must keep the peat factory open in in the middle in the Midlands, which only employs a handful of people compared to the 10,000 you could employ straight away on solar, right? And then people say, I've talked to politicians and they go, sure, there's no sunshine in Ireland. Look, that's bullshit. Like um, solar works perfect here. Yeah. So what needs to happen in the here and now to, 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 to solve this? I think it's an education thing. I think politicians need to learn not the negatives of this, which they've learned. There's been this kind of hangover from the Green Party and this kind of craziness that went on when they were in power. I think people need to realize this is the technology that's there right now. This is the opportunity financially for government and getting involved. Um, and that involves just maybe, heaven forbid, reading something about this and, and learning about it. Yeah. yeah. Um, down through the years, obviously, lots of different companies, lots of different experiences. Uh, has it changed you as, as an entrepreneur and how you approach yeah. business? I shudder to think how bad I was when I was 15. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. You were a child. <laughs> yeah. Well, the last... Certainly Crowley Carbon, we've become better entrepreneurs, you know, we were more aggressive, we're more direct, we don't beat around the bush as much, you know, and it's made us just, not just entrepreneurs, it's made us better people, you know, we, we're, we tell people exactly what's going on, we're much more direct, and we're much more credible because of that, but sadly it takes time 
to do that. Like the sooner you can do that in life, the better. The sooner you can be direct, you know, if there's bad news, tell the customers bad news. All those lessons, sadly, it takes a while to learn them. Is there too much politeness going on in business? Everywhere, everywhere, yeah. In business, in life, you know. Everyone's afraid to say what they mean. This has been very pleasant. I mean, like, have you parked any (laughs) level of politeness or are you putting (laughs) on a front for this um, this chat? Well, you see, we haven't got into mad controversial areas. (laughs) (laughs) But it's, you know, when you get into a disagreement, you know, it's back to vision and courage, right? I think we're more courageous now than we were, you know. But that's there's good and bad in that. You can be you can be a pain in the ass, right? Because if you're wrong about something, then you're you're being direct and courageous, but you could be wrong, you know. So. What about how you um you motivate staff? I mean, is there does the same bluntness apply in the office? Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Crowley Carbon is a very the great thing about Crowley Carbon is the staff know the team knows that we have their back, right? So if they're if they screw up, we have their back. If they're having the courage that we demand that they have, we have their back. And so they love that. If they're with a client and the client is acting the idiot, we're we'll phone their CEO and go make this stop, right? And they've never seen that in the workplace before. They have maximum freedom, right? They can we don't count their holidays. There's a whole load of things like that. The problem is, if you call it a problem, is it's they're not sheltered from the world, right? So if they screw up, they know they've screwed up, right? They see it right in front of them. So it's very empowering, but it's also very challenging. You mentioned they're not counting holidays, and that, you know, to many people sounds like a fantastic treat. Yeah. But there's also people who say it's a bit of a confidence uh, trick. It is a confidence trick. You know, and actually trick. people... Yeah. And people end up working harder. Well, like if you want freedom, you know, I think it's in one of these action movies. If you want freedom, it comes with responsibility, right? And so that for us is you can take as much holidays as you want. We don't track you at all. So if you don't show up for work until four o'clock in the day, we don't we don't notice because we're what's called mission led. So we're you do the mission. That's the job. But if you didn't notice that morning that there was a crisis, um, then there's war, right? If you one of your clients is in trouble and you're not answering that, big problem. Yeah. You you mentioned earlier we were talking about the, the the health problems that manifested themselves when you were working very hard with um, Inspired Gaming. Mm-hmm. The pace at which yeah. Crowley Carbon's growing now, yeah. does that start ringing alarm bells yeah. for you? Well, I I have the tools now. So every morning, run or gym meditation 20 minutes you know there are tools like lay off the booze lay off the coffee like these are all things that if you're going to drive as hard as we drive and work the hours we work then you have to use those tools especially you can get away with it when you're 22 you can't get away with it when you're 47 yeah yeah i mean meditation i can can get i get the whole running in the gym thing because there's very tangible visible results out of that yeah lots of people don't find the time for meditation yeah look meditation but running can be meditative too right meditation there's too much bullshit around meditation like what meditation is is it is thinking about something having a thought about somebody who's annoying you or whatever and then triggering yourself out of that thought back to somewhere and then having another thought and triggering it back so people say i've tried meditation it doesn't work but really what they mean is when i was meditating i was thinking about stuff not meditating but actually that's meditating meditating is having a thought forgetting about it having another thought forgetting about it it's a it's a process a process (laughs) nicely done with an american accent there well done very silicon valley um (laughs) <laughs> you know, if, if one of your staff misses a crisis because they're meditating, would you be patient with them for that? Yeah, but that would only be 20 minutes. I'd get over it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they I think our our team love that responsibility thing. It's one of our um, values is don't fuck the customer. Right. And it's written on everything we do. Yeah. And we're serious about it. Yeah, don't fuck the customer. <laughs> you, is, is there a lot of that going on where you see kind of uh, consultancy firms? I'm not sure if you describe yourself as a consultancy. It's certainly no, part kind of, of what you do, company, isn't it? Yeah. Um, we look. We look like a big engineering business rather than a consulting company. But um, yeah, like we hired somebody from a very big um, engineering company a couple of years ago, and I had a. We were over in Poland with a client and that night we spent a lot of time in a bar trying to figure out a particular technical problem for the customer. 
And then this team member just said to me afterwards, the day after, they said, I, I've never seen, they worked in four companies, they'd never seen people watching the customer's back when the customer wasn't there, you know, saying like, you know, there was a choice to sell the customer eight million quids worth of the wrong stuff or a million quids worth of the right stuff. And we just spent a whole night figuring out how to make a million quid deal rather than an eight million quid deal because it was better for the customer. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I guess maybe not everybody is doing that. Yeah. And I guess that goes perhaps hand in hand with the, the, the bluntness in terms of uh, yeah. winning, winning trust. Yeah, it's important for trust. Like one of our clients on a video call yesterday said to me, they said, Norm, what are we missing there? Like we were just finishing the job. It was a sign off call. And at the end of it, they said, what are we missing? And I said, I think the thing we're both missing here is that this is what's going to bite us in the ass. And so I was telling the customer our weakness and like they then the trust that comes out of that is huge. Yeah. You've been talking a lot about, you know, the, the, the freedoms that come with working for, for, for Crowley Carbon, the freedoms yeah. you've kind of instituted there for your for your people. Um, it strikes you, you could you could be free tomorrow because you've yeah. got enough uh, success. And let's yeah. put it, let's be blunt, cold hard cash yeah. in the bank and probably yeah. uh, investments to, yeah. to keep you going. Yeah. Is that well, not tempting? Well, let's play a little game, right? OK, so, I, I can't wait for this. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so you and I have set up a business together, uh, wackyapps.com. Right? Wow. Um, and it's a mad success, overnight success, in fact, because it's happened as we're speaking. And we're, we're selling it for $100 million, 50-50. Uh -huh. um, so 50 million to you. In fact, let's make it pounds rather than dollars. It's a bit more money. Um, so we've sold it. So what do you do? What do I do? Uh, bank it and run, <laughs> put my feet up for a while anyway. OK, yeah. So let's say, OK, so go on a holiday for six months. Mm -hmm. right? Probably not any longer. OK, then look, when you got 50 million, be impolite not to give money to charity. Right? Ah, yeah. <laughs> and then you keep going, buy a house, buy two houses, right? Are you trying to say it's going to run out? What happens is, you know what you do in the end? You go back to work. Yeah. And that's what happened with your, yeah, your good self. Yeah. So when we sold the business for half a billion, we took two weeks off in Portugal and went back to work. Just Portugal? Yeah. You could have gone to Pluto with that much money. <laughs> you can, but like, you know, when you have young kids, you can only go so far. But people have a vision of lying on the beach. But look, life isn't about lying on the beach. Life is about learning and working. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is um, the one business, as far as I know, that you've created that actually uh, bears your name. Yeah. Um, is there a, a signal in that? Is this is this a keeper? Is this a, a lifer? Yeah. Look, you can never say never because if somebody comes along and offers you to write a stupid amount of money, then you'll take it. But it feels like a keeper. One of the things that we've done with this is we've kept hold of the majority of the business. So we very we control eighty percent of the voting in the business. So what that allows us to do is if we get a mad idea. We can do that within the business. We don't have to. What happens with a lot of entrepreneurs is they have outside investors and the outside investors say, well, Mr. Entrepreneur, you can't do that crazy idea you have in here because we make widgets and this idea is about flying into space. Right. Oh, what a terrible idea, because if you have the entrepreneur, keep hold of the entrepreneur. Rule number one, like what we say in our business, don't fuck with the rainmaker. Right. So if they're making it rain, like let them make, keep making it rain. Right. And so that's what's key to this, you know. And so what we've been able to do with this is we have a new business, for instance, called Be Sure, which makes people safer when they work. It's kind of has all the buzzwords. It's blockchain. It's an app, uh, all this kind of stuff. And it may, we need to make the workers safer that work with us. And so this is what we're doing now. That's probably going to be big. We did that to solve a problem, but also we were able to incubate that within Crowley Carbon. We didn't have to go and set it up outside or whatever. Right? Yeah. So you're not resting on your laurels, obviously. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> there's more businesses in you yet. Uh, talk to me about your kind of uh, visitor experience um, projects. Yeah. There's one. There's one in in Ascari, isn't that there's right? There's one in Parscourt House. Yeah. So. When we sold the business in 2008 and we set up Crowley Carbon, we, you know, you're signing up for at least another 10 years of your life, probably more. So the thing we felt was it has to make a difference. So within the gambling business, we had we had incubated a charity called Right to Sight. Um, so in this business, when it's involved in climate change, we felt and we believe climate change is the existential crisis. Like every day we get sidetracked with Trump or Syria crisis, all that, and we should worry about those things. But 
you know, in the next 20 years, like life is going to not be as we know it right now. And every temperature, every weather metric is going the wrong way. And so we felt we had to do something about that. So in 2013, we, we felt that while the day job was helping climate change, we felt we could do more. And we talked earlier about the ignorance that is there. Some of that ignorance is done by lobby groups who intentionally put that ignorance into the world. But there's a huge amount of ignorance around how brilliant solving this problem can be, how much fun it can be. So what we did was we set up a foundation in conjunction with a couple of brilliant companies, the NTR Foundation, who've been super, Vodafone, Caller um, in Ireland, like companies like this, who were very visionary at the time, because we approached them and we said, hey, here's this madcap idea we have. And they were the ones who believed, right? And so we raised 3 million euros between ourselves and, uh, and those people. And we built the first of what's called Cool Planet Experience, which is basically an interactive center where families can come and, and have a laugh, basically, because it's not serious, it's not guilty, it doesn't, you don't feel bad. You actually can go in there and learn and have a good time at the same time. And so it's been a massive hit. So um, it officially opened in early March. Richard Branson opened, uh, cut the ribbon in January, but it was opened in March. Since March, we've had 5,000 people. Um, we've had 200 schools already. It's a lot of the time it's sold out. Um, and now what we're doing is we, we our new mission is to open 10 around the world. So Dubai will be next later in the year. There'll be three more in the Middle East or our Middle Eastern partner, then New York, Sydney, London. So and they're getting bigger and bigger. So the budget for Dubai is $10 million. Um, so um, and the message is massively getting out there. We get messages all the time from people saying, I didn't know that, you know. And is this purely philanthropic or is there is there any kind of a, uh, you know, revenue raising aspect to it all? Look, any philanthropy to a degree is a selfish act, too, because it makes you feel better in doing it. It gives our business a mission. It gives us when we're talking to clients, it gives us more gravitas. You don't get to do do good or shit without fringe benefits. You know, I don't think, to be fair to us, I think it's we feel there's a problem like our business. We feel like there's a problem and we need to sort it. Yeah. Uh, do you think will people be surprised that of all places in the world selling this message on, shall we say, a, a pragmatic attitude to reducing mm. or lessening the mm. impact of climate change that has come from from this little green island? Look, I hope people will be pleased, you know, there, there's a bigger vision for Ireland that we could have around climate change and our, uh, you know, what we can do about it. It's like I think Crawley Carbon's mission is to get that message out. Later this year, we're going to, I can't say what it is, but we're going to announce something to do with climate change that's so cool that you will be shocked. Yeah. When is that now? It's going to be certainly by Christmas. Yeah. Certainly by, I should set my calendar. Um, <laughs> uh, come on, give us a clue. What, what, it's roughly incredibly what feels sexy. It in. Incredibly sexy on climate change. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is it going to be a phone battery that lasts longer than a day? No, it's way sexier than that. <laughs> Gosh. That's where that idea is. This is where it is. <laughs> well, we await that yeah. with bated breath. It's going to be very cool. Yeah. Very yeah. good. Um, Norman Crowley, thank you very much for coming in and talking to us today. Thanks, enjoy it. pleasure. Thanks. Cheers. And that is it for the Architects of Business this week. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks to our guest, Norman Crowley, our producer, Patrick Cohey, and all of the production team here at Joe. This programme is made in partnership with EY Entrepreneur of the Year. You can go to their website, eoy.ie, to learn more about the finalists for this year. Make sure not to miss out on future and indeed past shows of the Architects of Business. You can subscribe for free on iTunes, on your favourite Android podcast app, or you can watch the show on YouTube. And make sure to check out some of Joe's other podcasts, which include the Hard Yards on Rugby, the GAA Hour, and our movie show, The Big Review Scheme. I'm Ty Genreich. Thank you very much for being with us today. We hope to see you again very soon. <laughs>